Hi everybody, uh, I'm Anthony Concilio. I'm going to be doing a little class on probably more of a question and answer kind of thing. I think you'll get more out of that on uh, street photography. But first I'd like to say thank you to Fujifilm and uh, Pro Camera Hawaii. Pro Camera Hawaii and Fujifilm put this together. And then um, John Bello over there with Expressions is kind enough to host us here at his uh, photo studio. So thank you guys. Can you hear me? Can you hear me all right? Yeah. Okay. So, um, just real quick, I've been doing street photography for, about, for probably about like six, seven years. Um, how I got started in street photography was I'm on staff at the paper, uh, midweek, star advertiser. So it's a job. I love working as a photographer, but it's still a job at times and you get burnt out. So I needed something to keep me happy shooting so I didn't burn out and just decide to quit. So messed around in the streets, social media, of course, found street photography, fell in love, and that's what brought me into that. And then um, with Fujifilm, as far as Fujifilm, it was just the form factor, the dials, just I went nuts and got into Fujifilm, which brings me here. So bear with me, I'm not a public speaker. Okay, what is street photography? Um, different definitions, there's different types of street photography. Um, I tend to be, I guess I float more on the fine artish side of street photography. I'm not the in your face street photographer, but I can be and I have. But it's normally um, catching everyday moments, you know, capturing it on film, uh, the catching the, what is it, the extraordinary and the ordinary. And of course, uh, Rassam was the decisive moment, catching that one moment in time, the, you know, fraction of a second on film of someone's life or your life. Uh, candid photography, documentary type photography. There's also uh, people who do street portraiture. In most cases, street photography is candid. You're not really staging anything. You're just catching things naturally and organic. But with street portraiture, you will tend to be asking someone for a portrait, unless if you're really good and you can get that nice portrait shot. Candy. And I will have a long question and answer kind of thing at the end. Um, yeah, I think I'm missing a one here. Um, hunting and fishing, that's how I identify the type, two types of approaches towards <coughs> street photography. You have your hunters who is gonna actively be walking around and um, you know, going, moving through the crowds, looking for their shots, you know, getting up there, getting up, up close, being in the shot with them without trying to alter the environment. Because that's one of the things you want to do is try to keep things natural. You don't want people to see you and start changing the way they're acting around you. So with hunting, you would be just moving through the crowds, just constantly on the move. Um, hunting, I think, that's what I said, right? Fishing, would, on the other hand, which is more of my style, is I'm gonna go out and identify a location that I really like. Uh, usually it's a strip of lights or a nice patterned wall or building, and I will f figure out where I wanna be, and um, I just wait for the right person to come through. I'm usually looking for some, yeah, we're gonna have to deal with this uh, concert that's getting ready to happen out here. So, um, yeah, right? We got background music for the video. Um, so, uh, yeah, so like patterns, textures, things like that. I, I look for something interesting that I find interesting, and I wait there. And when the person walks by, I'm usually looking for somebody with an umbrella uh, or a floppy hat holding something. Something that's, uh, I do a lot of silhouettes, so anything that's going to make a silhouette or a shadow look, you know, a little more interesting than just like a crosswalk stick figure. Um, and that's... I'm hunting because I'm hunting for my locations, but then I sit and I park my butt there and I go through and uh, just wait at that point. So uh, some might like one over the other. This would be an example kind of like a, so this is in Waikiki. I was just walking down the street and I just, not, I wouldn't say quite hunt, it's more hunting, but uh, I didn't wait there for him. It's not like I was waiting for somebody to stand in front of me. I just walked by, saw all the stripes. I like the colors in the background, so I just snapped a shot. 
this one was a, definitely a camping one or a fishing one. Um, I noticed, actually I was looking at a spot just off to the left of this shot. There's a stairwell so the light was hitting really nice, but no one was walking through that light. So I just took a few steps over and I noticed that the, the concrete was dark, it's in the shadows. So I knew whoever was walking on that road, concrete was going to more or less be a silhouette as they walked by. Um, that guy was a little closer to the wall. So this is kind of like a, this is kind of like a happy accident. So I was waiting for her to come by, but he walked through pretty quick, and I, I, got, I got lucky with that one. So a lot of times it, it is going to be luck. And uh, another accident was, you know, you look for things, which I'll get into later, color matching like green shorts, green surfboard, things like that. So there was a lot of elements. I got, you know, different levels here, somebody up front, mid-ground, background. So I, I like that shot. Uh, that would be an example of me. This is another uh, hunting. I was walking around. I had a nine millimeter lens on. So I, I had, I, this guy was like this close to me. So, but I was just walking around and I was shooting from the hip, which is another, uh, which I'll get to a little later too. So I'm holding the camera about right, I'm holding the camera about right here when I snap that shot. Can you guys hear me? No? Okay, I'll, I'll talk, I'll talk, I'll talk louder, okay. And another one, another example of uh, fishing. So I found my honey hole. The light was moving, but I, I knew I wanted to catch somebody in here. And in this situation, I wasn't sure. Um, there wasn't a lot of foot traffic. I wasn't sure if someone needed to be coming or going to get this shot. If they were coming at me, they would have been in the light, and I would have saw their face, which doesn't look bad. But I needed. I knew I wanted somebody going the opposite way so they were still in the dark as they crossed this this white area so that's what I'm looking for I kind of wait for that and I got lucky with the guy with the hat because there were a few other people ahead but it, it didn't quite make the picture just like a like me bald just just a round head things to look for is that better you can hear a little okay I should have put more on here then yeah okay so uh, and not in any particular order uh, emotion and gestures are a good thing, especially for people that are that are hunting. You want to get people pointing, expressions, being very expressive, uh, hand gestures. I like I like anything that's gonna make it more interesting. Juxtapositions. I have to look this word up every time because I keep forgetting the actual definition. So I'm gonna tell you my definition of it. So. It's probably two things that kind of go together but are contrasting or opposites, I guess. You know, someone going in an outdoor or an old, old person and a young person framed in the same shot, maybe doing the same thing. So, uh, light and shadows, that's where I kind of, I fall into. I like the light and shadows. Um, silhouettes, of course, are something, I throw that on there because I, I just go nuts over silhouettes. That's primarily what I am looking for. And then I, everything else kind of trickles down after that. Um, patterns and textures. Um, yeah, brickwork. I love brickwork. Anything that's going to make the shot interesting. A lot of this stuff isn't even really street photography related. It's just photography related or, you know, visually appealing. Um, you just apply a lot of it to street photography. It, it helps. I mean, it helps with any of the arts, I guess. Uh, color matching. Um, I'm always looking for, I still haven't found a yellow umbrella walking next to a yellow fire hydrant. I'm looking for that shot. But um, I, I like doing the color matches, um, which you'll see some of these examples in the back and I'll point those out. Leading lines, again, a regular photographic kind of uh, rule. And uh, yeah, so kind of patterns, texture. I like lines, I go crazy over lines. Um, and of course the shadows. So these, this would be more of the, the pattern, pattern and texture kind of a example. Color matching. I got really lucky on this one. This was this was actually a. The other two was a hunt, uh, fishing. This is definitely a hunting. I was actually really far, and I cropped way more than I would normally like to admit that I cropped. But I saw her walking, and as she was walking. The bu a bus had went by, and I said, "Oh my gosh, she's you know, 
almost the exact same colors. But she was like 50, 60 yards away from me, so she just took off. I just ran. She was almost at the intersection. So I'm still, yeah, I don't, I'm still like 20, 30 yards away from her. I can't remember what lens I had, but uh, yeah, I just shot and I just cropped the bejesus out of it. And I'm not proud to say that. But uh, this is an example of color matching. If you want, like, want leading lines or anything like that, that might be a stretch, but. Patterns, right here, I saw this. And it's another funny story with this shot. Um, I saw her dress, and I told the per I can't remember who was with me, but I told that person, oh, it'd be great if someone with a target bag walked by. And right after I said that, this guy had come across the crosswalk. And if I really want to reach for this, you can also say there's a pattern in the manhole cover as well. So, um, yeah, happy accident. I'll take it. But uh, you, you got to look around. With street photography, you always got to have your eyes open. I mean, I tend to focus too much on shadows and light sometimes, and I kind of um, pigeonhole myself to that. And I'll go a whole day and not really get anything I like, but probably passed up on a whole lot of shots that I, I, I should have taken. So it's just, uh, let's see, just always have... Basic rule, I'm, I'm always out walking, and I always have my camera with me, so that's like rule number one, always have a camera with you. Um, and other than that, just uh, keep your eyes open, look around, don't don't be afraid to turn around, because a lot of the shots that I get are, I've, I've passed it already, and I turn around and I notice something, like past an alley that's lit, but I couldn't tell, or, you know, you look up, look down, different perspectives, change it up a bit, so that'll help you get a lot better shots. Yeah, like a repetitive pen, a bunch of umbrellas. Um, this is in Chinatown. Most of these are in Chinatown, but uh, you know, a row of umbrellas at the market. And like I said, I really like umbrellas. So, and this lady comes walking by. So, um, and that one was a hunting. I, I was just walking on that one, taking the shot. I, I probably should have worded this better. Uh, these are these are regular kind of things, but I'll explain from like maybe a street photographer. Composing through the viewfinder. I compose through the viewfinder most of the time. I, I feel more comfortable. It should go to my eye. Now everyone, are you guys can still hear me? Or okay. So um, when someone sees me, they know I'm taking their photo because my camera's right to my face. I I'm, I can't play it off too well. I'm doing this and usually this or this, so they know I'm taking a photo. And sometimes I want them to know I'm taking their photo. I don't want to look too sneaky. I don't know, I, I might have wrote that somewhere else in here. Sometimes people kind of, uh, they stand in one spot too long, which I do at times, but they're kind of doing one of these numbers, kind of looking out the corner of their eye, look suspicious, get sneaky looking, and that makes people uncomfortable. Um, so sometimes it's nice to have someone, I mean, you know, have them see that what you're trying to do. Um, Another way is composing with the back of the LCD screen, which is a LCD, right? Is that right? Okay. Screen, which is like this, you know, because a lot of people use phones now, so they're accustomed to seeing people do this with their camera, and they can't quite tell where they're aiming at because you're, you're doing one of these numbers. And this is what I do, too. If there's people, and I'm not sure if I want them to know I'm taking their photos, I'll act like I'm taking a video, and I just snap as I pass them. I don't play it off too well because I will do one of these numbers, and I'll just stop and snap it, and then I'll keep going. But it works. It works. Um, shoot from the hip. That's there's kind of a loose interpretation. A lot of people use their cameras on their neck straps. So what they would do is they would have their on their neck straps and they would just fiddle with it there. I don't. I use a wrist strap. So I'm normally like this. So I will walk and I kind of have this big foot pose where I, I kind of step that way and I make sure it's on the end of the back swing and I snap the shot. Or I just hold the camera like this and I, I, I'll walk around. So I'm always lifting my hand up to not hit uh, poles or cars. So I got used to carrying my camera this way and I just keep my thumb on the, on the shutter. And I'll just walk around, I'll walk past somebody and I'll snap their shot. It's, it's funny how many shots you'll get like that where they are looking at your camera and it looks really weird because you, know, you got this great shot in there like this. <laughs> so. It's um, but it's another way to shoot without people, without people noticing too much, uh, and that'll take me to zone focusing. So uh, I know there's a formula for zone focusing. I didn't learn it. So what I do is I will before I go shooting if I know I'm with a wide lens and I'm gonna want to go through a crowd, especially if you're gonna go through a crowd, 
because you don't always have the time to have it focus for you. What I do is I will go up to a fire hydrant or something and I will stand about wherever I want to be away and I will set the manual focus on that. And I'm normally at an F8, F11 sometimes, sometimes F16 depending on how sloppy I feel I'm going to be. And um, by doing that I know I got a few steps, I got about three or four steps before I, before I need, um, before they get in range. And I'll just walk that way, then, that, then I don't have to keep uh, pre-focusing. I just walk around and I just snap the shot, it's just instantaneous. And you, you'll miss some, but you'll get a whole lot. So that's a good way to, to get a lot of these photos, is with uh, zone focusing. And you can Google the formula. I know there's a way you can do the whole, uh, at F8, at this, you know, you're good from three feet to infinity. I don't know all that stuff. That's how I do it. I, it's easy for me. Okay, so this was an example of a... Uh, so I was hunting on this guy, and I saw her eating her soup, but she was really going to town with her soup, and I thought it was funny. So I pulled my camera up, and actually I think I had the X-T1, because I wasn't quite accustomed to the, uh, the electronic viewfinders. And there's a delay when you put it up to your eye, that it pops on. So when I saw her, I said, oh, I'm gonna get this shot. So I kind of got a few feet away and I put it up, but it was still black in my screen until my eye came up. And as soon as, as, soon as the screen popped open, she was already looking at me like that. So I, I flinched, snapped the shot, and I just ran. I just took off the up Keomoku. So that's probably why, the story, that's probably why I added that on here. Um, but that was definitely, oh that's why, that was definitely an up to your eye. This was uh, up to my eye as well. This is uh, Chinatown. It was kind of like a, it could have been a hunting one, I mean a fishing one, if I waited long enough, because I liked the way the, kind of looks like camouflage back there. But this was, uh, this was up to my eye. But, yeah, anything can look, I mean, I think it looks pretty. I think. Any kind of shot can look uh, look good. Just always have your eyes open because you never know what's gonna what's gonna appear to you. Yeah. So I was waiting for some, so this was a, a fishing one. I was waiting for someone to walk out because they uh, at a certain point they hit the light, but she came in real close, and um, I kind of got lucky on this because she she sees me straight out. Um, I just like the whole mohawk looking thing that she's got going on. She had no clue I was shooting. She just walked in, so I kind of got a twofer on that one. So. Okay, avoiding confrontation and objections. So, I don't get approached too often, but it, it does happen. Um, that's where you pretend to be shooting something that you're, you're not really shooting. So, um, like, I wanted to get you in my photo. I would but you're looking at me, I would kind of like, uh, kind of act like I'm looking past, or I'd go with a thousand yard stare, because they're gonna look and you don't make eye contact, you just look beyond them. Then they kind of, they, they kind of relax a bit. A lot of times they're just gonna get out of your way. And there's been a lot of times when I had a shot that I really liked, where uh, I lost the shot because they, people tend to want to be nervous or be polite, so they, they walk out of your, your frame, uh, which kind of sucks in street photography, but, it's it's part of the it's part of the genre. Uh, don't make eye contact with people. Once you make eye contact, they'll feel that they can approach you. If you don't make eye contact, they're not quite sure if you were who they were looking at. Um, act like a tourist. A lot of people do that, and that's good with this kind of a, a shot. You're just taking pictures of anything. I've walked through crowds just look taking fake photos of rooftops just to get me where I needed to be without people getting uncomfortable. And then when I get where I want to be, then I kind of start to make people uncomfortable. <laughs> um, shooting from the hip is another way. Pe most people don't know that you're shooting when you're, when you're holding your camera, not, not to your face. Uh, try, again, getting back to that, try not to look uh, sneaky or suspicious. I tend to camp a lot, so I will be sitting in one spot for... Yeah, yeah, see, some people think I stand there for two hours, but it's usually like... 15, 20 minutes max before I move on. A lot of the times when I'm shooting, I'm shooting in early morning or late afternoon because I like the long shadows. And at those times of day, the light's traveling pretty fast. Noon is pretty slow. But um, in the afternoon, you'll, you'll see that shadow move around. And that's the other thing too. If you see a spot, identify a spot, you can tell depending on the time of day that, hey, uh, it's not quite there, but I need to come back in about 20 minutes. 
So then that's when I'll start walking around and I'll I'll come revisit the spot and see if anyone's there. Um, and if you do get um, you know, walk by as if you're oblivious to them. Just walk past them. And most of the time they're not gonna say anything. It's when you make the eye contact that they're gonna they know. And a lot of people will the ballsier people will, will come up to you and say, like, hey, you were you taking my photo? I don't know if I have the yeah, okay, here. If you do get approached, uh, this one I use most of the time, and that'll be, uh, I, th I get someone shot, and sometimes they don't even approach me. They might just look a little uncomfortable, and I don't want to ruin someone's entire day just so I can get a shot. So if, it, if I feel like I can get away with, I'll just go, oh, I took your photo, you look, you look great, I loved your hat, I loved your glasses. And normally that kind of compliment, they're, they're completely happy. Sometimes it's just a smile. Can you hear me still? I know they're getting a little up. Okay. Sometimes it's just a smile. A, a, a smile that goes a long way. Um, school project is fantastic. I don't think I can get away with it. But I know uh, other people... I, that's what I normally tell my friends when they first try it out. It's just tell them you're doing a school project. And then most people are like, oh, okay. Because the school does send people out on... Because you always see kids with the film cameras walking around. And uh, you just say, oh, just tell them, oh, sorry, this is a, uh, a school project of mine. And they're normally cool. And uh, I use this one a lot. Oh, I really like the light on you. So flattery, I just flatter the hell out of everybody. And they're normally pretty happy and content with that. <coughs> I normally won't show them what's on the back of my camera. Because in most cases, they will see themselves on there. So I pull out my Instagram, and I'll show them that. Well, this is what I do. Because my Instagram is mostly silhouettes. They're comfortable. They're like, oh, okay, you can't even see any of these people anyway. If you're an in-the-face shooter, don't show them your Instagram. But, um, and there's, worst case, run. Yeah, but use your better judgment, run. So would you feel I'm going to like this? I'm making it sound all combative and running and... So, uh, <coughs> this was uh, camping. I like the way the light hit the awning. And, uh, technically, I was waiting for this light to be red and someone with red to be in the, in the frame. But uh, traffic and people get in my way. It's, uh, that's, my, that's my thing. Cars get in the way over there. So, uh, but, but I like this shot. Um, funny story on this shot. I was camping there for... Not two hours, but I was camping there for quite a bit, and um, I guess the HPD had a seminar going, because it's right across the street from the police station. And they had mainland cops here giving the seminar, and they were doing the sweep across Chinatown. So there's all these undercover out there, and they're all hanging out not too far from me. And um, finally one of them comes over to me to tell me a funny story. They said that the mainland cops that were doing the seminar looked out the window and pointed, they said, whose detail is that guy on? Because he's screwing this whole thing up for us. So they thought I was undercover, and I was just sitting there with my camera. So I ended up picking up and going away for that. That was a hunt, that that was definitely hunting, because uh, why am I gonna sit there and look at a black shadow, right? So I saw the umbrella, these were a happy accident. So I saw the umbrella come by and I just wanted the umbrella to pop. And I didn't even realize that there was a... I didn't even know there were people in front or behind. I was just so focused on that umbrella. And then when I took the shot, I was like, hey, chop that up as a wind. So that one, I, I really like that shot. Um, it doesn't have to have a whole person. So um, I'm going to go back a little bit. So with street photography, back in the day, it had to have people. It had to be candid. It had to be black and white. And it had to be landscape oriented. Um, as you can see, a lot of my stuff's vertical. And I like color, because of seeing color, and that's what makes it stand out for me. Back in the day, they only had black and white, and people like Saul Leiter started really um, getting into color, street photography. Um, and they also used really wide lenses, but eventually some started going with a, a more telephoto lens. So I should have led off with all that. I, I'm not a teacher, so I didn't want to give you like a lesson on that, the history of it. But um, things that I do keep in mind is, um, Oh, also, they don't manipulate the photo. It's supposed to be candid, just how it's shot. So, same with me. If there's a if there's a Coke can that I can't remove by a slight crop or 
um, just darkening the shadows a bit, then it stays. So I don't I don't alter my images other than basic uh, exposure, highlights, shadows, black point a little bit. Nothing that um, I'm not doing anything that someone back in a dark room would be doing back in the day. So that's uh, a rule that I keep to myself. Other people, it's, you're taking a photo, do what you want with it. But for me, street photography is is candid and more or less unaltered, with just slight exposure tweaks. Um, I would like to say I got a lot of these right in camera, but I didn't. I tend to shoot a little on the hot side, um, so my, my shots are normally a little overexposed, and I think that's because I work for a newspaper, and newspaper, newsprint's not white, it's gray, so I shoot overexposed so it comes out balanced on print, So, which really messes me up when I'm shooting portraits for people because they blown out. So um, I shoot a little hot and then I dial back on the highlights. So that's, but my, my adjustments on my sliders are, are, are minimal, except for that one bus shot where I really just cropped in. And I normally only crop to straighten, and I'll crop a little bit, but not, not too much. But that's kind of like, a, that's rules that I impose on myself. And part of the reason I got into that was, like I said, to make it, um, make photography fun again for me. And uh, while I was doing that, I went with the, oh, it's the one lens, one body, one focal length. They used to shoot with one focal length only. And that is a great exercise if you're a zoom shooter. It's because it's gonna make you think different how you're gonna compose your shot. It also gives you a little exercise because now you gotta move in and out to zoom. So uh, I highly recommend you guys getting primes, try, at least trying a prime and going out shooting that way. Because it's easy to sit there and just zoom in, you know, a number of millimeters and, and, and get the shot. But to actually walk across the street or get up close to someone's face and get, and get the shot, it's different. And it's gonna give you a different look too. It's another shot. Um, as you can see, I'm, I'm, I'm all about the shadows. So uh, she's just standing in line at the market, and I just really liked her, uh, her shadow. Again, silhouettes. So I'm always looking. So when I'm walking through, the, uh, the background is what I'm looking for first. People are just like uh, supporting actors, and that's the star is the background. So I'm looking for that, and I should actually do a minimal this post or a minimalist uh, kind of thing because I have all these shots of just backgrounds with nothing in them. But, um, and I just wait for the right person to come by. Um, and you'll identify, you, you kind of have to be a little far in a lot of cases because if you get too close to your subject on a silhouette, what will happen is now you're in their light and the light's even. So you kind of have to have a little bit of a distance or it has to be really extreme for, to get a silhouette. more vertical, like I said, they wouldn't like me back in the 50s, but um, yeah, I'm looking for shadows. I saw this, thought it was cool. Immediately it was, oh, now I gotta wait for somebody to walk through. The light wasn't quite there, so I had to wait, so this light was actually, I shouldn't know which way it was traveling. It was just traveling. And then uh, this gentleman came out, he was just taking a picture of the sign, and I just thought it was cool. I was hoping that he was gonna move close enough to where this, these points touched, intersect, you know where that touched, but never happened. <coughs> Even at night, silhouettes, um, you can get good shots at night. You don't need the best lighting. On a, you know, sitting on the stairs. This is in uh, Wailai, off Wailai Avenue. Um, you, you can find it anywhere. Just You just gotta have your eyes open to it be open to seeing what you know what you normally wouldn't look at you know if you think of Hawaii everything's surf or this or that but you can walk into grunges streets and come out with something fantastic so I mean most of my stuff's in yeah Chinatown grunge dirty I think it's because I a lot of the, the street photographers I follow are like New York photographers London photographers and, and that that appealed to me so I wanted to find someplace close and I think Chinatown's beautiful so don't take it like I don't think that Chinatown being grungy is a bad thing. I think it's fantastic. It's got a lot of character. And we have a, we have a, for street photography, we got a lot of things going for it because we got a lot of different types of uh, environments in a small footprint. So you don't have to go travel across the country. I mean, you can, uh, Chinatown, Waikiki, Kalihi, uh, North Shore. I mean, you can do street photography anywhere. It doesn't have to be technically on a street. 
just uh, street photography is just how you're shooting it, you know. But you, you can go out to <coughs> Dillingham Ranch and get people with horses or whatnot. Just wh however you shoot, just uh, apply street photography techniques to how you shoot and see what you get. Yeah, so that was it for that part of the presentation. Now I think I'll actually answer questions that you guys have. The concept said you can stop yelling. Okay, okay. <laughs> Why is I still yelling? Does anyone have any questions? What percentage of your shots are pretty much in focus? In focus? Or out of focus? <clears throat> if I'm shooting from the hip, um, see, I'm, I'm, I'm also notoriously lazy. So instead of putting my camera on like continuous, it's still on a single shot. So, so as I'm walking, one of those shots are going to be in focus, and the other three or four are, are usually out of focus. If it's to my eye, it's normally in focus. Yeah, if, if I take the time to, to shoot. But there's been times like uh, I was surprised the lady eating the soup. I'm surprised that was in focus because, like I said, right when that thing popped, I was like, snap, and I, I just left. So I don't even know. I do get I do jump the gun sometimes, and I uh, it's not the camera's fault. It's my fault where. I'm pressing and moving at the same time, and I get a lot of the blur. So I have to, I have to sit there and cuss myself out in a corner somewhere in an alley and tell myself, "Hey, slow down, slow down," because I'm missing too much stuff. But in most cases, if it's up to my face, it's in focus, and I snap one or two. If I'm shooting from the hip, continuous, like, like continuous focus or that? Uh, no, no, that's why I, I'm lazy. I don't change my settings. So the only thing I change on here is uh, on the dials. Yeah, just. Yeah, I I don't go into the menu or anything. I don't change the, I don't change the. Um, I see. I, I don't even know what it's called. Do you have a preferred shutter speed you want to be Yeah. Um. Shutter speed. The preferred would be something high so I don't miss anything, but it's gonna the lighting is gonna dictate where I'm at. I also probably am backwards for a lot of people because my shutter is where I'm gonna make my adjustments. Where some people might I I'm scared to death of high ISO. So I normally don't go real high on that. And then my, uh, my aperture, I try to keep it f8 or f11, so I'm most definitely going to get a lot in focus. If you go wide open, you got that very small margin to get in focus. But if you go higher up, you're going to get more. And that's why, the, um, back to your question, a lot of the shots aren't really out of focus because it's so wide. So I got a, I got a wide swath of area that's going to stay, stay in focus or relatively in focus. But shutter speed will be the one like if I could I'd, I'd be like, you know five five hundred up or something like that, but like because of the lighting that's where I I Make my adjustments on that which is probably backwards. So I have to be slower at night I don't like jacking my ISO over like uh, Like I, I tell this all the time man. If I'm, if I'm at 1600. I'm really freaking out Even at night even at night man even at night at night. I'll, I'll normally go wide wide open Unless I know I have time, like that that one shot with the guy on the stairs at night, I, I had time. He he or she wasn't even paying attention to me, so I get down and I get my shot, and I'm thinking I can get closer, and I'm moving in, moving in. And I, I must have moved about ten feet, got the shot, and then yeah, walk off all weird. Um, I like longer focal length, so. My 50 millimeter f2 is my f favorite lens on the X Pro 2. That's what I'm using most of the time. Um, I do struggle more on the, the wider focal lengths. This is a 23 millimeter on here on the X100V, but uh, I just like this camera so much that that I will uh, I'll work I'll work through it. Pro Camera Hawaii. See Tony at Pro Camera Hawaii. Yeah, but, uh, uh, comment. Um, all the Fuji cameras, if you if you turn on the focus scale, you, you get a you get a depth of field display on there. So what I do is I, I turn that on and I, and I can focus different points and usually have a million meters. Which yeah. Is sort of like how many paces. Yeah, I I, I put mine in feet, but I don't even look at the I don't look at the yeah. menu. I mean, I don't honestly. I'm a lazy photographer. I just uh, everything's I'm eyeballing it, but but I know what you mean, and I, I should actually learn a lot of these things. But I don't know if I'd ever apply it because I'm so set in my ways. Because I have it down to where I mean I know if I'm so far like I got I got ten feet. If they're walking and I'm walking, I know I shoot them at you know 
uh, a certain length. I, I either add or subtract a step or two, and, and uh, that's how I am. If I have to go back and do math on this, it's not fun anymore. And that was the whole, yeah, yeah, just. I, sh I really see this. This is you're embarrassing me in front of the Fuji film people. <laughs> so, um, but uh, it, while we're kind of on settings, um, so F8 will give you a wider swath in focus, more or less. You got more of a margin of error. That's how I look at it. Um, shutter speed for me is determined by the light. Um, an ISO, but like I said, for me, I'm scared of high, high ISO, so I tend to play it on the safe side, and I keep mine. Mine's normally about, in the daytime, I keep it about 400, um, and then I just have it really high on the shutter speed. Um, at night, I'll go up to about 800, maybe push it a little higher than that, depending how much I need the shot, and if I want to print it or if it's just going to be for Instagram. Um, because I don't like to do a whole lot of post-processing. The other reason I don't like to do a whole lot of post-processing is because uh, I have to do it for work. So if there's something not there, I have to edit it out. I have to do all this other stuff, turn it in. And this was supposed to be the fun part that makes me still enjoy taking photographs. So post-processing is real quick. I go through my 50 photos. I'm a minute, minute and a half a photo. Just quick, done, move on to the next. Um, any other questions? See, this is what I was counting. I was hoping you guys had a lot of questions because I don't know if I answered anything you wanted to know in here. So this is where I was hoping you guys would. I got a yes. So uh, you ever just go out and just keep it on all over? Back in the day, it was like just get the shot. Yeah. Um, just like you wanted, you got the shot. I've. Um, me, me is really good at just. Yeah. Put the V out, you're not going to get a bad photo. So I, that's, that's I shoot manual. <laughs> I should sometimes, I do tell myself, oh, I, I wish, why didn't I just go auto? Why didn't I just go auto? But uh, this, is, this is just me, it's, it's an exercise too. So, uh, and, and nothing against people that shoot auto or, or you know, the, the different priorities or anything like that. For me, if I did that, I would feel like I'm not being a photographer, I don't know. I don't know, cheating for me, I, I, I would feel like I, would, I cheated on that shot. And that's just me because I'm trying to, I've always shot manual. So, I'm, 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 and I'm pretty close too. I mean, I'm not straight out the camera perfect, but I'm, I get close enough. I mean, it's really simple. Just a couple of sliders and I'm, I'm done. So, uh, honestly, I'm, I would like to get some more shots that I, I miss, but I don't know if I, if I went auto, I might make it worse. I don't like it, uh, um, predicting what I want to shoot too. I know, um, well, especially if you're shooting with the shadows, right? Like yeah. Because a lot of times it wants to expose the shadows. The shadow, and I'm trying to make it... Blow up the yeah, I'm trying to make it um, black. Oh, that, that's another point. So if you're trying to shoot harsh shadows or silhouettes, you expose for the brightest spot, and then the blacks will just naturally crush. If you start exposing on the person, it might start to balance out the, the shadows. You're going to get a lot, lot more detail in the shadows than you want. So uh, I expose for the hot shots, and the hot spots, and I... I go from there. Yes? When you call your photos, how often do you come back to a photo you thought you didn't like, but then you reevaluate it? And then how do you keep things that you might want to revisit? Okay. People are going to. Okay. I do what most people. I, I do what everyone says not to do. So I will go. I will call through my photos that night, and I will. Uh, well, I'll upload them and I'll look through them, and I'll wait a day or two. Because you know, I want fresh eyes on it. Because you know, sometimes you uh, put a lot of effort into a shot. You might be married to that shot because of all the effort you put in. But it's a crappy shot. You just did a lot for it. So I wait a few days and I go back and look at it. But once I look at it and I call through it, anything I don't like, I delete. So I'm only keeping a small handful of the shots. And a lot of people tell me, why do you do that? Because you never know this or that. But I'm like, you know, I'm, I don't even look at back at half the stuff that I've shot that, that I kept. It's only just the one one or two that I really like. But I do have uh, some, like if I do shoot, shoot sequential, I might keep one or two of those. But um, yeah, I, I don't go back to them. I go back to them when I need to look for photos for slideshows. <laughs> that's when I go back and look for them. Or like if there's a show or something coming up. But mentally I know which, which photos I really liked. Um, 
Does that answer the question? Yeah. 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 yeah I don't. Um, I don't spend a lot of time with that part because, again, for work, I have to pull through a lot of photos and I have to give them a wide selection to go through. And it, as soon as doing this feels like doing that, then I think I'm going to stop doing it all. So I'm trying to. You know, I don't want my worlds to collide, kind of thing. It's to the point where I have a lot of uh, like XT fours and everything like that. I don't shoot fun stuff with my work cameras. And I don't shoot work with my fun cameras. It's all separate, which makes me sound probably kind of crazy. But I have it all separate. Yes. So, what is your work camera? I have two XT fours and a bunch of the the red badge lenses. The, the 16 to 50, uh, 50 to 140, and some a bunch of primes that I use. And for my um, fun cameras, I've got the X100, and I have an X Pro 2, and I have a lot of the the smaller uh, the F2 lenses. I have the whole collection of all those. And I, and I, I try to keep the cameras small for street. That's another thing. Um, if you have, I first started with another brand, and I had a big lens on there just to give street photography a try. And then when I got into this, I just fell in love with it because it was so compact. But um, if you can go with a smaller form factor, it's easier because you don't look as imposing. If you go out on the street and start doing this and telescoping your lens out, it tends to draw a lot more attention. And the whole point in going out and getting these kind of shots is you want to keep the environment natural. You don't want to alter anything that's going on there. You don't want, well, maybe you do want people looking at you. Because she looked at me in that one photo and that was way better than what I would have got if I she didn't look at me, but um, in most cases, you don't want you want to be a fly on the wall. You don't want to you don't want to stick out. That's why I was thinking that a compact camera would be this. I guess. You mean like an old point and shoot kind? But they're slow, You're right? Most yeah. I mean, there's a there's a lag. It's like yeah, when you when you take the photo and with street, you tend to unless you're good at predicting that split second in advance, um, you're gonna miss a lot of those shots. I think phones are like that too, right? They're still kind of slight lag, right? They're getting better, but yeah. And the best camera to have is the one that you have with you and Fuji film. <laughs> so, and I fell in love with them. Oh, yes. Sorry, one more time? I couldn't hear. Um, I'm just curious, like, what you do with the photos once they're, they're done. Is it, like, your own pleasure? Do you have them up in, like, stock photos on websites and things like that? Or is it by social media? Or? For me, social media, Instagram, I just throw it up there, see how, who many, how many people like my photos. I'm a slave to social media on that one. Just Instagram. I'm a slave to that. So I, I post it up there. Um, I do enter some shows. I actually have one... Um, one image that's in the show right now, uh, Fuji Fanboys, they did their fourth annual best of show. So I came in second place for the X100 series. So it's a traveling one. So it's been in, uh, I think, Singapore, London. It's in Dubai right now. And it'll be traveling to a few more. Uh, it was in London. And it'll be in a few more countries. So stuff like that, yeah. Anything to stroke my ego. I think it's always been a little humble. There's no. one viewer, so you want yeah. across the world. <laughs> Shop at Pro Camera. <laughs> so, yeah, but but uh, I don't do uh, stock. You know, people have asked, uh, but I don't I don't know if this what I shoot would be appealing for somebody to buy. I've had people offer to buy some certain image, and some of my stuff will tend to look a little more on the fine art side. I mean, you could see it on the wall hanging, but I, I I've never taken it serious about selling it. I usually it's after a show if I print something and they want it. They want to buy it. It's already printed and framed. And yeah, okay. But I, I don't go out and advertise that I'm trying to sell images. But um, it's crossed my mind. I look at stock photos a lot. And a lot of them. Oh yeah. Uh, would be well. Oh okay. I will have to touch base with you later then and figure <laughs> out which which companies you're using because anything to bring in a little extra coin, right? For me to buy more Fuji film camera gear from Pro Camera Hawaii. <laughs> Any other questions? No? Do you ever find yourself using the need for CPLs or FPs? Oh, filters? Um, 
I used to use CPLs a lot. See, you're, this is a tough question to be asking, to be asked from a guy that sells all this stuff. <laughs> um, for work, I definitely do if I'm around water or if I'm in a city, and depending on the time of day, I'll use it to get rid of a lot of the, um, the glare. Uh, for street, I, I don't. I haven't had a need for it, but um, you know, I'm not really anywhere that has that. Like, I'm in downtown a little bit, but I'm normally shooting on the street, street level. I don't get a lot of glare off windows. I, um, I don't come across a lot of sweaty people that I need to remove the glare off their face or anything like that, and I'm not really shooting around the water. I, I, I know a lot of guys that I shoot with, they shoot down at Waikiki, and I believe they do they have the circular polarizers on there cameras when they're doing street photography, but they're like right on the water. They're walking along the, the, the wet water mark and get people sunbathing, which for me, I mean, they come up with great shots, but for me, I think I've, I would look and feel a little pervy walking around the beach, snapping people in bikinis, so. So, I have polarized, I have filters from you, Tony, at Pro Camera Hawaii, from Pro Camera Hawaii. Uh, and I use it for work, but for street, I don't. I don't have any filters. I don't even have a uh, UV filters on most of my my street stuff. It's just uh, yeah. But I'm also a guy that uses lens lens caps. I know a lot of guys, especially in media and journalism, they don't. They just a filter cover and, and that's it. Well, if there's no more questions, I'm gonna turn this over to. Lewis is going to be doing a seminar on nightscapes and what, general camera. Yeah, okay. yeah. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Hopefully, I answered all your questions. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Um, actually, this was the second time doing a class here. I think the last time I was here, it was actually exactly three years ago, 2019, uh, in John's studio. That we had Tony Casilio doing a class. I was doing a class for the equipment. Uh, my name is Louis Navarro. I'm in the West Coast, uh, technical senior representative for Fujifilm. Been with the company for uh, since '96, and I started from servicing mini labs to digital printers that went to the service bureaus. And then in 2000, I was uh, recruited to the professional side. Um, what that means is working with dealers, professional dealers, uh, with gear, uh, professional studios that uh, will do commercial products, and also commercial labs that did a lot of the printing for commercial Trains that you see in the mall, studios, uh, wedding photography, things like that. So in 2000, I had to give up shooting professionally. Uh, my uh, manager said that would be a conflict of interest since I was getting all my phone for free. And so if I go to a studio and they see me at a wedding, they think I'm taking their gear away. But you know what? I think it was a good time for me to complete my journey with uh, wedding. I did weddings for about. 25 years. Uh, I did my first wedding was uh, 15 years old. Yes, I didn't have a license, so they had to give me a ride to go to each location. Uh, my first camera, I was 12 years old, so it was probably in 79. It was a Fujika 650. And uh, when I chose that, it was really beautiful classic camera. It almost looks identical to this, silver. Uh, back then, a black finish would cost you another $50. Of course, today you get the same price. Um, but those days, I when with my parents, if I needed one or wanted something, you 
you earned it. So I was doing yard work, newspaper routes, everything I could do to get my first camera. And how I fell in love with photography is uh, one of my math teachers uh, had me get my uh, math book in the center of the, kind of like a quad four or three walls and they kept everything, all the supplies in the middle. And they had these silver canisters and reels and asked them, what's all that about? He says, well, I teach photography, black and white art. And uh, he says, you should try and join and learn about photography and printing. And I think when the first thing I saw, the late in image appeared to the paper, and I think that's the first thing I fell in love with photography, because that was magical. Uh, it is definitely a different experience than when you're taking a picture from sight with no previews, and, and then they get sometimes the unexpected things when you have a process, or when you're good at it, you expect what you saw, and there was no changes. Uh, so uh, throughout that time, I went to a second camera, but it was a Fujika camera. I was in the high school newspaper, yearbook, three years, and uh, one thing I did do is, my other favorite thing was engineering, electronics. So I actually went to engineering electronics first for five, six years, then I went back to school for photography. And I started doing weddings back in the 80s professionally, and I think uh, back then it was a twin lens. So it was a Mamiya through twin lens. You have to look through one lens and it photographs another lens. And the challenge is that is you're taking pictures of a ring, you had to slightly tilt it because you're so close, because you have the part focal. Uh, what you see is not what you're going to take a picture of. And then I moved into another medium format camera and shot. Photographed probably 20, 25 years doing weddings and probably over a thousand weddings. But I did also sports. I did uh, automotive racing, landscape, um, commercial. And I think what I'm doing now is what I enjoy. It's landscape, I like astrophotography, um, automotive racing and um, everything between there, no more weddings. Uh, but I really enjoy um, the camera experience. And I think when we introduced the X-Pro1 and I was able to set it into black white mode, because we have back then one film that was very typical to our Neopan film, black white film. And looking at it in black and white really brought me back from the 70s why I enjoy photography. And the best part, you actually had able to change some of the filters that change your contrast, red, green, um, orange, or um, uh, yellow, to just make it subtle, very contrasty, so that was the joy about it. Now we have not just Neopan, but we also have what we call Acros, that was uh, more, more uh, dynamic range in blacks and whites. So from that, I did really enjoyed everything else in photography. So one thing that I started back in 1981, I think when I first got my license, is to venture outside uh, photography. And I think what made it more challenging is photographing at night. What made it more challenging is photographing at night with slide film. Has anybody done slide film or chrome film? So ne color negative or black and white has the longest latitude, biggest latitude. So you have almost 12 stops. So if you've got partial, you've had a good exposure. Uh, shooting slides. If you're one-third exposure off, it could be overexposed, underexposed. So that's how critical you have to be. So your light meter was your best friend. So I had an external light meter and was able to spot meter everything. So I was doing that and plus night photography. And what I enjoyed night photography is it looked different from the day. You had colors, you had shadows, uh, especially the lighting, because lighting doesn't exist during the day. And then one thing that really got me going was, there was a, I'm out of Southern California, and there was a place in Long Beach a lot of refineries and there was a little man-made island with these palm trees and it's all fake but they're hiding like a little refinery uh, depot there but they put palm trees to make it pretty what they've done is they put these color spotlights and that's what i did is i went over there with my camera with my really inexpensive uh, tripod and probably nobody knows about back then is i bought it at zodi's i don't know if you're aware but that's before walmart's and all those Kmart's and uh, I got the lowest price and then but that held my camera for a long exposure and just a regular cable release. So moving forward now I now I do it with digital cameras and we have more fun to play with. We could do light painting, uh, we have uh, lasers you can paint with 
And of course, don't play in anybody's face on that laser, but it just gives you, transforms your subject to a new look. And it's, uh, I think it's more of a craft. The more you learn, the better you get, and it seems like it's a sort of a, a secret just to do that. There's some tools I'll use. Uh, when I do light painting, I, uh, since there are 20 seconds, 30 second exposures, I do use a tripod. If it's a Wendy, a heavier tripod. Um, if I was going to do street photography or go somewhere to, uh, for night photography, maybe a very compact to a tabletop that I could put on top of a trash can or on the wall. Or there are times that if you can't use a tripod, because there's sometimes tripod police, believe it or not, especially in Paris, um, it's okay to bring a monopod because you only have front it close to you and they will not kick you or sometimes they will fine you or arrest you if you don't move. But So there's the tools that help you get to that image. And um, it can vary as things go. You sometimes have more tools than you have the last 10 years. I'm going to go ahead and start. Okay, let me back up one more. Actually, since we were going to do this one second, so let me go back to the other one. And here we go. Sorry for the delay. That was a program change. Back to Nightscapes. Move that a little bit quicker. A couple of things I've, um, I've used. Um, uh, apps, things that I talk about, light painting, cable releases, locations. Uh, one of my favorite apps is the Photopills that helps me get to the proper lighting on location. Different lenses, uh, sometimes if I want to go wider I'll go with the 14. Uh, most of my focal length is about 30 millimeters, 28 millimeters, 24. Uh, it all depends on what I'm trying to cover it. If I was going to do the Milky Way, I'll go as wide as possible to 14 millimeters or wider. One thing you want to check in your bag, and I've done this in the past, and that's why I recommend is make sure your batteries are charged. Have a backup battery. Uh, especially, not here, in a cold climate, your batteries do drain pretty quick. Uh, SD card, you'd be surprised how many people I know are there, ready to go, and they forgot their media card. And that could be kind of ruin your whole trip. Uh, and of course you don't want to pull your phone to do your photographs. So there's ways to have things to remember. Maybe leave one in your car. Uh, I have friends who put one in their wallets. I don't recommend that because they do crack and they're useless. Um, anyway, you can have memory cards all over. They're inexpensive, especially SD cards. Any way you can remember uh, to have a memory card, a few. Uh, best is to have a list. Check it off and make sure you, before you leave the house you have all these items. Lens cleaning too. So starting, this is close to my home. It's a train depot. Uh, it is uh, almost sunset, but it's now it's going into twilight. And usually you have sunset, then you have uh, the golden hour. Well, golden hour, then sunset, then you have twilight. This is between your twilight and sunset. Your colors are being more presented by the ambient colors from the street from the city, from the trains, uh, so it gives you that feeling. And of course, you could change it because it's digital, you could change it. So, but now you're still, you're still getting some of the blue color. Now where you're getting more closer, and this is more of your uh, sunset with some uh, more of your red in your skies. And I've done this shot a couple times, different ways. I've got it in motion, and then I have it still, so it's really what you want to present it to. What's that motion? where the still looks, and then also getting my other option is getting the reflection off the water. So one thing I do like to do is I like to get the reflection if there's waters. Uh, that's one thing I enjoy too. As little as we get is rain back home, is go photograph when there's rain so that you get that reflection on the street puddles. Here now we'll get in what we call the twilight, deeper blues. Uh, so from the same spot, you can actually get your, your sunsets, your golden hour, your uh, blue hour, and now we're getting closer to your twilight. Normally, we don't really, visibly with our own eyes, we don't, really, don't see this. This is a little bit longer of an exposure. By doing a little bit of longer exposure, and I'm talking about maybe two seconds, you start seeing, seeing more of the blues, the atmospheric blue. 
and anything further than that, you're going to see more of your black skies. So one thing I've done, and this is in Seattle, so it's the, the Ferris wheel, is I look around and see what I see. This is actually was behind me. I wasn't paying attention because the other across the street was the Ferris wheel. Looking at this, I was looking at it and looking at it and said, well, these people are not moving. And I realized they're mannequins looking at the Ferris or the America go round. So to me, that was a fantastic shot. And this was, I did have a tripod, a very compact tripod. I was trying to expose properly inside, but at the same time, just kind of give you a slight lighting so you can see that it is people standing, but not enough light to show you that there are mannequins. So this was one of the sh uh, images that one of our colleagues shared. He's up in Maine uh, doing exposures, Milky Ways off the water. Uh, this brightness, uh, there was a lighthouse. So try to correct some of it. And that's having a lighthouse kind of hinders your image, but at the same time, you still could get a longer exposure to get your Milky Ways. Uh, so you just have to play with your time. So usually a recipe that if you have a 20 millimeter, try 20 seconds exposure. Um, you could try ISO 800, work at 1600. Uh, I'm a little bit more opposite from Tony. I'm not afraid to go higher ISO. I think our cameras does a very clean ISO. Our sensors are very unique than everybody else. We, are, we use what we call X-Trans sensors. X-Trans sensors is the mimic more of a film pattern. Uh, so it's more like a grain. Compared to what everybody else uses a bare sensor, they pretty much looks like digital noise. So that's why for me, uh, if I do street photography, I'll set my camera to auto ISO up to 12,800. To me, it kind of reminds me when I was photographing with black and white film, 3200 ISO. Uh, most folks who were using the high ISO was your newspapers, your press and stuff, who didn't need, they didn't want the limitation, not getting their images uh, photographed and still in still motion. So here's the image looking to the side. It does show the lighthouse. Uh, except they were using a pretty wide lens, so that's why this angle, but at the same time, they did get a pretty straight image from this building. It just was more of a fisheye lens. But it kind of fits. You've got your sort of your Milky Way with a foreground with your light, uh, just a different two different images you're pulling, you're pulling from, either from the side that you just got the edge of the water or more of a bigger picture with more information with the lighthouse and also another, I think it was controlling the, the power for the generator for that lighthouse. One thing I enjoyed also is um, not adding just night photography, but I also like uh, doing panoramics. So yes, our cameras do have a panoramic mode that you could do 120, 180. They work great during the day, but just like the light, you need more light. So that's just what I was doing. It was just using a rail, doing my nodal control, doing seven exposures. And each exposure was about, I will say, three seconds, and then just compiled it in Lightroom. Uh, this is just the uh, kind of the seedscape is we got the two stadiums in Seattle, one's for baseball, one's for football, and then I was just waiting for the rest of the lights of the building just to come on, and it just kind of gives you that effect. So this is between your uh, blue hour and your twilight. They're both kind of coming in at the same time. And this is sort of, again, blue hour, but this is during the sunrise, before <coughs> sunrise. So we get that blue hour twice, you get the sunrise golden hour twice, except one sunrise, one sunset. Uh, this is at one of the national parks on the side. I just placed my camera because I didn't have a, uh, a tripod. We were traveling uh, for work. I just like one of these little pillars. I just put my camera, put it on a cell timer, and I think I put it for 20 seconds and got this exposure. Uh, this would have been about seven years in San Francisco. If I would do that again, San Francisco is not as safe as like it used to, so I would just go quick and take the shot and run. Also, you want to probably be with quite a few people with you just in case. And then you run in different directions. So this is a, a image that we photographed and it's a place called Brago Springs. It's in the desert and it's surrounded by a lot of mountains. So what helps us to photograph there without winds, the mountains actually block the winds. 
and it was an event that we did uh, this past October. And it was called Nightfall, so it's great for astronomy. Uh, a lot of people come with their telescopes, but we did a workshop called Nightscapes, and we're allowed to take uh, long exposures and have a couple of us paint with light. So everybody has to be on a tripod. We probably did ISO 400, uh, 20 seconds. Depends on what lens you had, but it varied from 20 to 30 seconds. There is a gentleman who does these sculptures. He does so many lifelike, full size. He goes as far as making the size of a full Jeep with two, uh, two subjects that look made out of metal. You know, he just welds and uh, these, the whole Jeep, and he does this throughout to the desert. Uh, he has a huge gallery that he does full size of uh, different uh, like horses and um, every type of characters. Uh, they're larger than life size. And he, the desert itself, the city, they put quite a few of them in this one road that allows them to take pictures during the day. But I think during the night, I think it just really pops it out, especially if you're doing light painting. Most of the light painting is just your small little LED flashlights with narrow beams. They work really good. And if you want to warm it up, uh, a lot of times I'll just put a uh, filter, uh, we call a uh, CT, maybe 2.0 filter, just slightly warms things up. It's just a jail filter. Um, this is something I was doing too, is I think this was with X-Pro1 in San Diego Gas Lab, just walking around. Uh, like this, Tony said, what's the best camera that's on uh, with you? It's whatever's on with you, you know. We had cell phones back then. This is probably 2013. Cell phones were not known for good cameras. You know, times have changed. But I just had a 14 millimeter, and I, we were just going for dinner. You never know where you could expect. And I had this gentleman just making this huge, big balloons of, of bubbles. And then across the street, there was a person that gives you taxi rides on their bikes, and it was just lit up with LED lights. So it's just kind of something last minute, just shows up at the right time. And, uh, with the camera, it just allows me to be really quick. Um, I usually keep the hood on so I don't have to put a filter. So if it hits the wall, they just hit the, the filter or the hood itself. But I usually will have no uh, lens filter or uh, lens cap, so that way it doesn't delay me to take it off. Again, this is in Borrego Springs. Uh, it's a serpent. It's pie over, I would say, 50 feet. What he's done is just different patterns that it goes across the road that has the hump. Uh, the main picture is you're photographing the head of the serpent. Uh, I think we had about 15 people, so we were trying to help everybody do their exposure. A lot of times, I would say most of them never handle their camera manually. And really to do this, you have to do the camera manually. Your ISO, your shutter, your aperture, so you can have full control that we can light it up and you have some good results. If you leave it, leave it out in auto, it's not gonna work. It's just pitch dark. Uh, your long exposures is picking up the background. The only thing that allows us to get the exposure is just the flashlight that we're hitting it with. And, and it's really sort of a experiment. Uh, I think the reason I said experiment is we gotta try five times because not everybody's ready with their shutter. They don't see their shutter at night, so sometimes it's good to have a little light. Uh, the nice thing about our cameras, we do have what we call the dark mode. The dark mode, your whole display goes orange, kind of like a light safe for your eyes. Same thing with astronomy photographers, so they just use a red light to prevent your eyes from going, your pupils going from large to small, and then everything looks dark. So it allows you to have your pupils still being bright so you can see your cameras. So that's a mode that we put in since our X-T3 cameras. So it's a good function if you're working at night. And here we are, it's a subject is the cricket and the scorpion that look like in the battle. So we added some light. You kind of see the figure, the person behind there lighting the back. There was, we had two people lighting the back and then somebody in the front, we were just hitting with the lasers, just adding something unique, different. At the same time, make sure you're not hitting the laser with the other person behind it so you don't blind them. But, you know, they try to protect themselves from behind. And I think in this one, we just added a filter to the back of that flashlight. Um, and then you pick up some of the lights, some of the stars. I can see a lot of the stars here somehow, which is just the paper, gray paper. You're gonna lose some of the contrast and the sharpness. So this is uh, Disney. Yes, we're annual pass holders, my wife and I. And uh, sometimes we just go on a Friday for dinner, walk around at night. And I think that's what I enjoy is it really 
looks different, lights up the park, seems like it's alive. Um, just walking around. Uh, I, there are times I will take a gorilla pod that allows you to anchor around the post. Going to security, they don't like tripods. And there are times they're threatening to take the tripod, a little tripod. And then they says, well, okay, you can keep it, don't extend it. It's like, you go in the park, people are extending the tripods. Uh, they're worried about people tripping over. So sometimes, uh, if I forget a tripod, I put it in the trash can, but I'll bring this little guy, put this little ball head or Acrotech ball head and put it on a, like a trash can or something. Nice thing about the Gorilla Pod, you can wrap it around the rails. There's plenty of rails. I've done posts. Um, it gets a lot of use, that little uh, Gorilla Pod. It's, it's, um, it's very flexible. I don't know if you've ever seen those things, but they, they actually, all three legs are very flexible like a wire and they grip really good and and around the ball there's like a rubber so it prevents it from slipping so it's a very useful product it's not it's very I think it's inexpensive to use and travel with and you can put pretty much any ball head they do have a ball head kit but uh, it, I think it was designed for very minimal exposure or, or weight one thing I enjoyed is motion and not to expect what's your outcome um, we're doing there's a concrete pad I put my camera and run it for three seconds after COVID I noticed that the th first five seconds these lights come on and they go off I think they're being cheap because before COVID these lights these uh, uh, umbrellas and lights um, they always stayed on through the whole ride and so I don't know I think they were just cutting costs but so that means I was have to as soon as it starts get that motion and then get the light and then the lights go then I stop and then wait for the next ride to come up so I can take another picture but each picture and then each exposure, you've got a different motion. I try to get it between you can't recognize the person, but at the same time you can recognize the cups. And then with the lights, different re uh, reflection because each cup is, uh, has a different color. Uh, I've done a 40 by 60 print that sits in my wife's office. And that was just a 16 megapixel from our XT1. Uh, so, it's amazing how much you can print and when people say APSCs or small files, no, they have a lot of detail. We don't have a low pass filter, so that means that the image, the light goes on the sensor, it's untouched, because a low pass filter, what it does, it defocus, that means the processor has to refocus and resharpen, so it's already being retouched. Ours, you get the true color and true, uh, true sharpness, so your ability to have pull more more information and also better dynamic range just on a smaller camera and from X Pro 1 uh, now we're in the fifth generation of a sensor and processor imagine now we could go from 60 megapixels now to 40 megapixels that with you get more detail and you would think with the more pixels you're gonna have less light ability no actually technology has definitely improved and you're getting less, less noise in the higher ISOs Reflections, this is just the water of the castle, just to get a look, seen it. Uh, I think our favorite time to go to Disney was in uh, the holidays, because they light everything. It's just a corner, nobody really walks this way, but for me, I just spot the reflection, and something I make it look different. A friend of mine was traveling, he got a photograph, I'm not sure if he was in New York, just a side image. So, uh, he kind of shared two of his images, motion, uh, make it look really different, uh, unique. Uh, really, you can just stand there or you can move with the subject up the direction. But because it's a, really in low light, you can stand there and just get this motion of light. Uh, lights, that's the beauty about uh, night. They have these special balloons that they have lights in it. So it just gives you a look and something that you don't see during the daylight. Uh, it's more of a dramatic uh, ambiance for me to do. To capture again, not again, another one of the castle. Uh, it kind of changed the theme every year, the lights, but it just makes the castle look different, nicer in the nights. Uh, fireworks. So sometimes I'll take pictures of fireworks, pictures of clouds, because you can always superimpose them on other images. Now with Photoshop, they give you a library, but why not have your own library of uh, stock? images that you could use for other images that might be boring uh, they can put over the castle and stuff like that uh, so it's always good 
Even if there's nothing else in the background, it's good to have as stock images that you superimpose to other subjects. So for me, Nightscapes is also, I cross it with street photography. Uh, this is up in Seattle, uh, near Pike Place. And just because inside the diner, it just lights up in red. The person's by the window, but there is another person she's talking, just kind of a moody place. It's just a stereo case that we were walking into the Pike Place. Uh, just caught my eye. Uh, it was just, uh, I think it was the XT5 with the 30, our new 30 millimeter macro. As soon as I turn around, there was this exposure. Now you got the lights in the city and the blue scape. Uh, so I was able to, in the same spot, turn it around, get two different shots. Uh, I kind of learned this years ago. We were in Palm, not Palm Springs, Joshua Tree. I was looking for this direction for my sunsets. And then my friends, they got different sets, sunsets and we were sharing. It's like, you got this and they got this. And we were totally two different things, but we just had our back to each other. So we realized that you could capture two different looks, two different subjects with minutes apart. So I always recommend what you're seeing, turn around and see if there's anything better or that's good to take photographs. Another, going up the steps, actually there was an elevator, another Ferris wheel, it just gives you the window looking through these subjects. Uh, to me it was just, besides being cold, but it looked uh, kind of still, a matter of being cold out there, because it was 30 degrees, well, actually 29 degrees, uh, but it, to me it looked kind of very tranquil, you know, very calming. Close this here. Pause for a sec because I closed that window. There we go. Hopefully it doesn't change. Um, photo booth, or actually it wasn't a photo booth. It's actually a doorway to go up to the stairs. I just saw somebody put a sticker pointing up, leading lines, lights kind of leading in. Uh, to me it was just everything kind of fed into itself, leading lines. Uh, going up to the stairs and, and just because of the ambient light again it looks much more dramatic on the computer than it does here but it was just something that we were standing for the elevator and turned around and to me I thought it looked pretty neat to take a picture of here's another subject uh, actually we had a, one of our uh, ex photographers uh, Rinzi uh, we took him to a place called uh, the gum wall the gum wall is all the walls have gum. Somebody posted, puts their own gum on there and it's covered the walls, both sides of the walls. Uh, when I took my wife there probably five years ago, they just finished cleaning it because next to it there is a uh, restaurant and the health inspector says this has to be removed. But it wasn't their fault, it was just the tourists putting all this gum. So I think when I took my wife there was only this big of a patch. Now it's yards, just a walkway, both sides of just different colors of gum. Somebody put a picture of Jesus and somebody said, holy Jesus, because they all saw all this gum on there. So it's just very unique. Uh, everything, the post, everything was gum. So I try to stay in the middle, so I wouldn't touch anything. <laughs> this window was covered with gum, so it kind of reminded me of stained glass. I had my colleague in too close. I go, no, I'm staying here, so got the right lens. But it's just, it's just a thing that they do up in, uh, it's where nearby with the, the first, uh, the original Starbucks was. Oh, it still is, still there. And there we go, there's the Starbucks. That is the original Starbucks. If you go during the summer, they have the queue, they have long lines, people waiting, 50 people at a time. Uh, I got a story for this. So I finally did go in one time, and that was this time. I just had the 100S and I was taking pictures. And somebody else came in with a DSLR taking pictures and they, they threw them out. Because they saw my one or V as harmless or a phone as harmless. So you're actually nice about having a small camera. You're very low key and you're not being intrusion. You know, it's just to them it's fine because they don't think that you're gonna make uh, big posters or anything like that. And so that's what's nice about having small cameras that allows you to get into places that you couldn't go with bigger cameras. Uh, so there are times I don't bring a tripod, I bring a monopod, keep it very concealed. Sometimes it's just 
just the camera itself with our pancake lens just moving around. No, no uh, neck strap, just my wrist strap. And that actually brings it down more concealed because you're not hanging over your shoulder. You're just taking pictures, bringing it up, taking some more pictures. Uh, so there's different ways, knowing your areas, what's allowed, not allowed, but still have opportunity to get those shots. Again, at night, definitely past the twilight. So it just gives you the ambience light from the interiors. Uh, that's where the place is called the uh, Public Market. It was across from the other side of the coffee shop. So you are in the middle of the street, just got to turn around and get the shot. I just like the colors. The booths that were selling apple cider uh, kind of tells you where you were. It's, uh, uh, the crowd's not as big as the summer, and that's what I liked about it is, yes, you have to put up with the cold, but I'd rather put up with the cold. If you plan it well, looking at your temperature, bring the proper clothes, you enjoy it. If you're cold and you don't bring the proper clothes, then you're feeling miserable and you're not going to enjoy taking the picture. So um, I think it's different. And that was last week. So now I'm in 80 degree weather. I'm enjoying it. Ring shorts. There I had to have a heavy jacket. It's just part of the experience. This was just looking up the street just because of the colors, people talking to each other. I noticed this couple was in the middle of the street. He was taking the picture of him. And then they move out of the street. It's just uh, very kind of, I don't know, Unique people like to take pictures of this location. It's pretty much well known in the world. And this is kind of like the main entrance, the public market. Right in the center is the fish market. I don't know if you ever saw pictures. They would throw, you pick the fish, they throw it to the person who's going to weigh it. And they could be, I don't know, 25 pounds and they actually do catch it. In. And they're usually a pretty young kids. When I say pretty young, they're in their 20s that are able to lift these things and just throw it across. To me, I just like the color of the reflections of the cars. These folks, they're just there watching these people throw these fish, and they're taking pictures. So I'm taking pictures, the photographer's taking pictures. Uh, but it was just fun. It's just a nice way to capture the ambience of this location. Again, turn around the other side of the street. I like somebody's painting on the side, the color of the sky. Uh, kind of represents the city, uh, but it's totally different. You got the old city that never changed, probably from the late 1800s to the new, more modern. That's further you go. And of course, I have to add the holidays. So since it was last week, just kind of shows you that it's the holidays during the time I photograph the pictures. Uh, just gives you the a bit of a, the storytelling without me saying anything. And of course, you gotta enjoy your evening. So a couple of beers. This was more in Portland. It's, Portland's very unique. Um, everybody warns me not to go to Chinatown, so we don't go to Chinatown. But there's a place that had all these little trailers with food, uh, different foods of uh, uh, Indian food, Thai food, hamburgers. Uh, I think you have 30 to pick from. And then they have a tent with a heater in there, so it keeps you warm. Uh, fantastic food. And it just the only reason we got there is one of the guys, uh, Renzi, who has a friend who's been living up there for 15 years. That helps a lot to take us to places where we could go and places we shouldn't go. Uh, so doing that, it's good to Google or knowing some people, look at people's columns if, if they recommend to go. Because the one, uh, if you recall the one with that panoramic of the city of Seattle, they had the two stadiums. I read a column that was five years old they said, pack a gun. And then I talked to somebody recent in the month who says, oh no, that's changed, it's been cleaned up. So things do change. So if you try to get information that's more recent and uh, finding things in uh, Google, you'd be surprised how much information you can find out, you know, more recent stuff. Because um, a lot of these places are pretty common. I think at the bridge, there must have been 15 photographers, a very popular place, so we felt pretty safe for that. And here's a picture I did, I just, walking down to my wife and I were going to uh, the yard house. It's just, I look at shapes and lights, and to me, it caught me uh, this portion. Uh, just really enjoyed it. It's just something that's unique. Um, many people have gone to the yard house, or yard house there. So they recognize this at night. Some people who go in the day maybe don't recognize it, but I think it's beautiful shapes that almost like waves, they design this thing. And then, of course, I turn to the left, and you got these colors, and of course, like Christmas, uh, with the 
almost the waves of this glass. Um, that's pretty much is. I don't know if I train my eye, but it's colors that I attracts me. You know, attracts my eye to take pictures. Um, I enjoy black and white, but night photography is always nice to see colors. I think it really draws you in to see these colors and really allows you to crop it the image. And that's probably the second image. I'd, sometimes I might have gone too far, or sometimes I have to recrop it because I didn't get it perfectly straight. And I'm always trying to get vertical lines, straight lines. Otherwise, it's going to bother me for a while. So this is in Portland. Uh, another Fritz Street photographer. I know Tony knows him. Uh, Renzi. Ryan, who's, uh, who was our guide, that helps us a lot. Um, Renzi's from LA. Um, he was wearing a wolf jacket, and that wasn't enough. I had to take him to Costco, get a down jacket, just so he could be comfortable and happy about, you know, not being too cold. And so that's the point is, it's when you're used to warm weather and you're gonna go cold climate, uh, definitely research. Um, it is a hassle carrying coats and jackets. I, I try to bring a small uh, light jacket or pants that are waterproof, uh, but if you're not prepared, you can always buy it. So you can enjoy your vacation, your travels. Don't let the weather limit you what to photograph because I think your experience uh, and going to the place because you may want to go back and maybe different parts of the season. I think seasons do play different parts. Um, problem with going this time of the year, daylight hours are very short. So you've got to plan that so you plan your days. And of course during uh, summer, uh, uh, long hours. So if you're waiting for nightfall, that takes a long time because they're further north just going. As you go to Alaska in the summer, if you ever want to do a night photography, forget it. It never goes night. It's twilight, or it's not actually in the twilight. It's still like, look like sunset going into sunset, but it doesn't go to sunset. It's still daylight. Thank you for attending this class. Um, any questions? Anybody? Tell me, got. So we've got a couple more minutes. Yes. Do you have a for landscape tip? Favorite film simulation that you play? Like I am nice. really enjoying the new nostalgic and the reason is when I was um, it's not a film simulation nostalgic is we introduced in the XT4 it is a film simulation and again it's not a film simulation but it's a channel that if you printed your images in the 70s and 80s I don't know if you uh, if you ever saw from parents or maybe you saw images that had round corners uh, they had a different morph the film had a different color so your blacks had more magenta, a little warmer colors. Blues, more cyans. So it was a look that we generate, and that's what it stands, it's a look. And I've been really enjoying it because it reminds me from photographing the 70s and the 80s. It's just that look that we have. Uh, the other one I enjoyed, um, I really like uh, uh, black and white, both Neopan and Acros. I do shoot and JPEG mode and also and RAW. So I can always change it. Of course, now the new cameras will allow you to photograph at HEIF. You have more dynamic range and a smaller package. You can pull more information. Uh, so now I'm kind of able to do that. And so I can actually get more information. It goes fine. The computer can open those files perfectly fine. But you can actually pull a lot more information than you could with the JPEG. Uh, very close to what a RAW image, just in a smaller file. And you could also process it in the camera, within the camera itself, into a JPEG, into a TIFF, uh, so you do have other options just in the camera. So what the way I do is I'll take the HIF and I'll convert it to JPEG, make some changes, then I will save it, then I'll transfer it to my phone, then I'll actually will share it online, or I will print it into my little printer and share that image with somebody if I took their picture. Most times I will take pictures when the people don't know about it and they're not really looking at the camera. But there are times I've gone with my wife when we've gone to a Disney cruise, I'll take a picture of the cast member. They're dressed as the holidays for Christmas. And I actually will hand them to them because usually they're there to enjoy your trip. And I'm there to give them a memento, especially if they're on the water for three months away from family. So I've been doing that. But all of a sudden, I think the second day or third day during breakfast, I actually can you pose I took this picture runs out in the kitchen comes back with seven other people the word got out that I was giving out free pictures and so I took their group picture handed them all out 
And they got a very small little stateroom, a little bunk, and that's the only thing they got to what they're enjoying when they're smiling. Because, I mean, they do smile the whole time. I mean, because they want to reflect that with their guests. But I think it's something that nobody else does. I've seen families that will bring their, all their kids in the stateroom will have all this Instax picture of the kids. So you know this is the family because there might be five families so they know which family's in that stateroom. Uh, but that's why I like sharing images with folks. I don't like, I take your picture and I'm walking away or I get your picture, give me your email and the person may say, I might see him or I might not see him. This way they actually have something physical. And it's not paper, it's actually film. It's actually will be around Rock Kaiba for 30 years. So it's very, I think, very tangible means more something to somebody else. You take a picture digitally and you see it in display, it can be very easy to delete and it's very disposable. Uh, I think more and more wedding photographers are, have to learn to photograph and film because now you have brides and grooms who appreciate art that they have expensive paintings. They actually will go and hire a photographer who knows to photograph film that is more challenging but they know it's more organic. It's not disposable. They actually, there's a negative and they're willing to pay a lot more for that. So I think that's why more and more of the young kids are buying film cameras and taking pictures with film. And uh, I think the best part is they're learning how to expose. And I think that's why, as Tony's been mentioning, you know, you can put in everything in auto, but I think when the first original X100 came out, one comment I saw, and this person was in Thailand, it said, fantastic camera, but it made me realize how bad as a photographer I am. Because they were relying on auto. But it, then he said in the very, on the very bottom, he said, it made me a better photographer. Because now you control. So if I was taking your picture, but I'm getting the background focus, but you let the camera do it. It's not, not like you're meant to do that, but the camera doesn't know what it wants. And that's why filmmakers, everything's focused manually. Everything has to be on the mark. Exposure, focus, everything. That's why they have people that just bracket focus and they have a separate operator for the camera crew. And you have somebody remotely focusing because that's how important it is. Um, that's the thing about cameras. Yes, cameras have done a better job focusing eye detection, subject detecting everything, but I like the technical part, but it's not that really technical. It's really knowing the three points of your triangle, aperture, shutter, and ISO. And those, that's all you need for get your proper exposure. When you can control that exposure, there should be no surprise. So a lot of times I will turn off the LCD and just take the picture, look at it later, and not being surprised. <coughs> Unless somebody closes their eyes, that's about it. But I know what I see and I get it because I have that control. And that's why I think people like is the controls. And um, I'll show you on the next slide. And uh, to kind of brief you what are each cameras line up, uh, depends what you're looking for. And it won't take too long. I'll make it pretty quick. Because um, we're trying to make it more translucent. What does each line up? What does XT line means? What does XE means? GFX means? Uh, so we've been doing more uh, a flow chart what each subject does what it means what's it for the right person uh, what you're trying to accomplish so we do have a heritage from our days 85 years and over film started motion picture black and white got into color uh, so when the days of film for Nikon Canon like uh, Olympus they either put ECFA, Fuji, Kodak, and they never had to think about color science. Never. Just make lenses, make camera bodies. Who's better to know about color? Fuji, because they've been making film for many, many years. The other person would have been Kodak. Unfortunately, they're no longer, uh, because the demise of not released, really, they didn't want to lose the traction of their film. At the same time, they're the first one to come out the first digital camera. So. They, lost, they missed the boat. They could have done both. Um, so when I look at images, I can tell you, well, it's kind of cold. That's Nikon. It's kind of too warm, too orange. That's Canon. Uh, Sony, they don't know where they're going. Um, I mean, my training was color management because I dealt paper and chemistry. It has to be accurate for commercial. 
So believe me, we were training our films, what color should be. We have um, a film director come from Japan. Uh, that's all it is about color science. As soon as he turns 40 years old, they move him to a different field. Because for males, 40 years old, your color is not as accurate. Females could go up to 45 years. They see color more accurate. They have a more of an advantage. Uh, so they, that's why they bring young people to direct and they get extremely trained in color. Uh, so that's why they like about our colors. And that's why I have photographers who just shoot JPEGs. There's a setting in here that will take one shot, three different images. And you can choose your black and white, your color negative, and your chrome. Shows his clients and says, oh, I want this and this, and it's done. Doesn't have to color correct, it's just already correct. It's the color he, he meant to do. So um, people who are worried about size storage, uh, SD cards are very inexpensive these days. Now, I think you can find a 32 meg file or 32 gig card for under $20. So again, film days, digital, and now meeting format. So people ask why we don't have 35 millimeter. If you want a lot of detail, meeting format will give you that detail, It'll give you the dynamic range, that uh, noise to signal ratio. So if you ever have a place that you're taking the picture of the forest, and you're doing uh, sunrise, you know, skies are blown out and the clouds are blown out, but you want to cover them, you want to protect them, but then you lose your forest because of the blacks. But medium format dynamic, dynamic range and the noise uh, signal ratio means that it will save your blacks. There's a lot of detail. When other cameras try to save the blacks, it fringes to purple. It just doesn't know what to do. Or if you do cars during the day, night, uh, during the day, the fender well, the, where the rims are and the tires are under the fender, they're in the deep blacks. They don't have detail, and that's what uh, medium format it really brings it out. Uh, so instead of taking three images and superimposing just to get a, what we call HDR with one image, you could pull that information on any application. Sometimes I think I could pull more information if Lightroom would let me to do that. It's just how much information this will have. So starting, uh, hopefully we're making more uh, headway on our cameras, is we introduced the H1. It was, it was around for a short time, but it was the time that we needed to test uh, IBIS. It was the time we introduced our video, our Cine lens, MK, so that was very important. And of course, X-T3 came out later. It just was a different generation with the sensor, but that uh, IBIS what happened to go into our GFX 100. That was very important for us to, have, to work with. So H is our flagship camera. H stands for hybrid. And if you look at that, the H2S, S is your, your video camera first, then your stills. Well, let me, it's no slouch for stills. Think of S not just because it's a stack sensor, it's for speed. You could do 40 frames per second, terrific for low light. Uh, DP review, Chris and Jared, named it Cinema Camera of the Year, and overall, and other manufacturers. Now how good? We don't have limitations. We don't have a professional cinema. We have professional cinema lenses, zoom lenses, that goes to Ari, to Venice, to Sony's, to uh, Panasonic, We're partnership, you know, we have partnerships with them to put these big, expensive cine lenses, but we don't have a line to cross over on our professional camera, so we can put as much as we want without stepping anybody's feet. Uh, so they did a wonderful job on that. H2, our, it is the four, first 40 megapixel APS-C. So it is getting close to our meaning 50, meg, 50 megapixel. But the, because of the bigger sound, again, noise to the signal ratio does have advantage on the meaning format. Uh, but now you have a 40 megapixel that's very compact. What we mean by hybrid, it is um, a thicker magnesium alloy camera. And the lens mount is actually more robust because you can probably put longer lenses, cine lenses, so it can handle the extra weight. Uh, we've got two of the dials, we call PSMI dials, so all this can be programmed for stills and videos, shooting uh, any type of mode, motion, video. Uh, I actually have one mode that I'll do astrophotography, and I'll tell it, turn off the IBIS, turn off the low light uh, correction for uh, artifacts, anything I want and I will name it Astro, so I know it does all that for me. Um, so I don't have to think about it, so darn, I forgot to turn off uh, IBIS and there's some motion. 
anything can be programmed, anything from Medusa and still. So we make it kind of easy on that. The upper deck was designed from our GFX lineup, the 100S. We try to make the, the menus easy. Uh, you can program your favorites in three different ways. You have your function buttons, that all cameras have function buttons, the front, top, everywhere. Then you have we, my favorites, the Q button. All the Q buttons uh, you can find from the back and from the top. Uh, it's all the favorite things I'd like to do that without going into the menus, I just press it and find it really quick. And then you have your favorites. My favorites, with all these, you will cover, I would say 80 pages of functions that you could get to it and customize it. And it takes seconds. Even you could change, I may be doing astro, next day I'm doing portraits. I could customize this button within seconds and I'll put iTech, keep it IBIS, maybe no go, maybe I uh, have uh, shorter depth of field. You could do all that within seconds. Or you program it and put portrait and do all those settings. You can save those things. Again, going back to the films, um, somebody mentioned um, our favorite films. So uh, back in mid 2000, I had two customers in Southern California. I uh, had Surfers and Surfing, and there were two different magazines. Uh, of course, everything got enough combined with that and skateboarding and mountain bike climbing and everything else. But back then, surfing magazines were enough for all these magazines. And both magazines said, we'd rather use Velvia for our magazines. Reason is, you, Velvia will give you blue water, blue skies. They do Kodak, purple water. They don't represent the accuracy of blue. So nobody just wants to see a centerfold or cover of purple waves. They'd rather see some blue white, you know, blue water waves. So that's why it took them a long time to really to change from film to digital because of that reason. Besides, besides they invested a lot in their housing, uh, but it was the film that sold their covers, their magazines. Uh, so we have uh, portrait negatives, two styles of portrait negatives. Pro negative eye is, gives you, if it's overcast, gives you a little bit higher contrast, a little bit more saturation, a little bit more pop. California, Hawaii, I think we got a lot of sun, so we don't have to worry about it. Seattle, they probably like that. My favorite is the neutral. It's always got daylight, so you don't want over too much contrast, too much color, saturation, perfect film for uh, Southern California and Hawaii. Nostalgic, nostalgic uh, negative, this is the new negative we just introduced on the X-T4. Now all the rest of the new lineup has it on the new cameras. Astia is a film that's very uh, low contrast, very low saturation, with design for commercials. So if uh, you're gonna do a cover of uh, cosmetics, it will give you that true red uh, or true blues or whatever makeup, and it's very one-to-one. -one. It's Or textiles, clothing, it gives you the true color or tonality of their hues. And that's why commercial photographers use that. Uh, what I like about it, if I was gonna do a portrait at noon, uh, if you shoot photograph a new what happens, you get those raccoon eyes. That will soften those raccoon eyes because it's a uh, lower contrast film. So that's a great for portraits. Uh, Provia adds a medium contrast, medium saturation. So we have it called it uh, standard. That's the first uh, color negative on the top. That's it's pretty much your normal uh, default. And then we have our classic negatives and then what I mentioned, Velvia. We do have a classic chrome that we didn't do, but we kind of copied a recipe. So yellow box, you can guess what it is, but uh, it's uh, somebody that uh, doesn't produce that no more. But we managed to kind of work into our channels. Any questions? Because I know we got just 15 minutes. Questions, questions. Okay. So when I said we're gonna be more transparent uh, H is, it is our hybrid camera. It is a flagship camera. So below the flagships, your X-T5s. Same sensor that H2. Difference between those two is uh, H2 will have a bigger buffer. So if you're saying, well, I need, uh, I'm gonna do a lot of birding and I want not to slow down because the H2 and H2S uses a CF Express uh, Type E card. And it's a much faster card, a lot faster. So. Plus, besides the buffer, the card's going to able to download those images much faster. Uh, what we like the XT5 is the size. Uh, it's incredible. You know, H2S, 6.2 open gate, 
H2AK. This no slouch. This will do 6.2, not open gate, but it will do um, everything else. Plus, you could do ProRes external raw. Um, the other ones you could do ProRes internal. It does require the CF card. Um, anybody have seen the movie Marry Me? So, as the movie came out earlier this year, we actually were doing a New York show in 2019, uh, October, and we went across the street. They were actually filming that movie. They were using XT3 to film JLo and Olsen. And, and then JLo had a influencer. Uh, somebody followed her for her social media, and what he was holding XT3 in black. So it's just kind of interesting that both were both cameras that they were using. Of course, it was well equipped with our Sydney lenses. And that X-T3, when that came out, that was a full cinematic camera. The same quality you go to the theaters, that's where you got the quality from. It's just now we really jumped up to the quality of uh, more options into a small, small package of a camera. So below is this X-T5 and X-T30. Uh, we did some updates, uh, not just hardware, but there's some software that really gave it some of the really, really good features on S20. S20 S20 was, we called it uh, the Baby XT4. It was uh, smaller, but great for video. V bloggers who wanted to start it, but it was well packed with good, good uh, video, go, very, very good for stills. And then um, flagship for rangefinders, X Pro 3, and then we've got the 100B and XT4. Um, so it kind of tells you the direction. Uh, any of these cameras you buy, even XT3, when they say I'm looking for a camera to grow with, you got the same potential of these cameras to, to produce quality as you grow. Uh, anybody who's aware of our cameras, we give you free firmware updates and we constantly improve those cameras and it grows with you to very advanced features. So it has basic features, but you could grow to very advanced features and make some really great production work. Skip this, but just kind of going over to some of the specs uh, on this too, it just gives us a lot with 422 color, ProRes, everything else, full HDMI. That's also another difference between XT5 and XT H and H cameras is you get a full HDMI connection. The new sensor is going to be a little bit faster. Uh, this one's more high resolution. Um, it's just new technology, so we're able to pull more information without gaining really any digital noise. Uh, actually, we improved almost a stop with, without affecting any digital noise or anything like that. So that's why it's very pleasing uh, as you go lower light. Uh, Likewise, uh, probably go maybe negative 7 EV, so it's, it can actually find a person. If you're looking at a person at night and you can't see their eyes, the camera will, try, will lock on already before you can even see their eyes or blink. Uh, a lot of the, the technology, we have AI technology, so it learns on its faces and the animals. Uh, it has motorcycles, uh, if you do auto racing, uh, birds and uh, trains, uh, it's constantly learning. Um, and it does a really good job for tracking. And as you go, if you put in continuous tracking, it will follow that person. We had a new processor, faster response, improved battery life. So everybody likes improved battery life. Um, now we're getting uh, on the XT5 uh, over really 740 shots per battery life. So that's really good. Um, I like to say just that's our 40 megapixel camera. So if you Want it detailed, uh, that's the camera to go because you got 40 megapixel. It does, the, uh, does 8K. You could uh, downsize to 4K or 6.2K if you need that detail, you need to crop in into your video. This is what's very unique for us. Uh, two things. Uh, we actually have a fan option, pan and fan. If it's very sleek, it fits really nice. We learn from our competitors that. Fans are important when you go to 8K. But not just 8K, but if you do it high speed, it's really good. But it's not just for video, I actually use it for Astro. If I could keep my camera cooler, the less noise it produces. Because I'll do a minute exposure 65 times with my tracker, and if it keeps the sensor cooler, the lower the noise. So, not just for video, but it's great for stills too. We have a grip, we have two grips. 
One that holds both batteries, both will hold both, uh, both two batteries to increase your battery uh, uh, energy. One is what we call uh, data transfer, uh, file transfer. It allows you to have connect to a Ethernet so you could do video over IP, high speed broadcast. Second is USB C. It's not to charge, but if you have a 5G phone, Android or iPhone, uh, a phone, Apple phone, you can actually tether and you can actually send it to your, um, your uh, server. And then we also have a Nemo antenna that I could be outside in the parking lot photographing people and your images are coming installed. Flat Grip has so much potential. Back uh, a few months ago at uh, Adobe Max in LA, we are the first still camera to do wirelessly through camera to cloud. Anybody familiar with camera to cloud? Frame IO? And that's okay because anybody who has the full creative package of Adobe got that already. It's free. A lot of people are not aware of it, uh, but you'll be more aware of it as time goes on because Adobe bought Frame.io for mostly for motion pictures, studios, HBO uses, Netflix. They could shoot a video or full series and it will transfer through their servers without having to FedEx your hard drives overnight. Ours for stills, I could uh, connect to my hotspot on my phone, take your picture, and within seconds, it's right there. And that person could be in Germany. The editor says, you know what? It's too cold, too warm, move your reflection, and I'll get that message within seconds. I'll do that change. So he can edit. The editor can actually edit six different projects through different parts of the world. Um, but we're not just going to do stills. We also could do ProRes. We could do video. Uh, our launch, right now I'm working with the Alpha uh, software, will be probably early this, uh, next year, it's going to be early next year, is I'll be in probably the Alpha, uh, a beta mode, and we should have an early spring. So you could do, take all these pictures, going straight to the server, and they could, if you do an event, you do spec events, they'll instantly, will see it right away. Uh, not just stills, but video. Schools, if you're doing pictures of schools, the people who organize and color correct, they're getting within seconds. They can already get it prepped right away. Uh, so there's a lot of things about camera to cloud that we coming out. I think uh, our uh, the other one who was be the first camera is Red. Uh, they just announced as of yesterday or today their beta is starting this month. Uh, so it's moving pretty quickly. And so just because of this grip, it's going to allow you to do a lot of things without a third-party device. Uh, so I'm sure. Other manufacturers are going to try to do what we're doing, but we just had a head start back in May with this camera, and it's a partnership we've been working with Adobe. And uh, I think the most questions I get, would it go straight to my Lightroom or my Photoshop? That's Adobe product, so it's the feedback you tell them, and they will bring it out to you guys. Uh, but we're, we're capturing the, the interface from their uh, SD or F CF card going straight to your servers. And um, it's very simple. When the final production comes, you just hit uh, Frame.io, connect, your phone app comes up, gives you six digits, you enter the six digits on your phone, because the six digits is coming from the camera. Those are encryption, so it's totally secure, and it, it unlocks and releases those images, and depends who you're sharing with, what folder that project, so it could go to different people. If you're a big corporation that goes to editors, colorists, and everything else, then they have a business uh, package for that. But individuals, it's free. You know, you'll see more information, which is really excited. We're the first still camera to do that with uh, any uh, outside hardware, just with our own hardware uh, available. And I'll be doing some demos tomorrow, not tomorrow, sorry, Sunday, uh, over the counter. I've uh, been taking these little Legos, putting it together, and just taking pictures, and they'll see instantly right away that they're coming in really quick. And that's just using my. Uh, You're demo the grip with the transfer. Yeah, yeah. It's just. And I can share with people, and it's just all these projects I've been doing, and uh, it's just really exciting. It's just uh, so much potential what you could do, camera to cloud. Sorry Without, if I missed it, but where that's from the from the grip? Where where is that server? Sorry, that server. Where's your server? So okay, so it, is your server here? It's going yeah, right here. It's okay. Because you're signing up to your camera to cloud from Adobe right here. Okay. And your folder says you have this folder, you have this folder. Everybody sees it. No, it's, going straight to you, fully equipped. Yeah, yeah. Or if you want to be on location, your laptop, start working on the laptop and share with somebody else. It's just seconds. You get in the full res, 
full video, ProRes, everything else. Uh, so for video photographers who is getting these, uh, you know, most of your Hollywood will do two minute shots and all that. You may have a couple hours of uh, reels, and then you can actually pull a sizzle reel within uh, minutes, and you're already posting that within minutes that you got it from that day of the uh, shoot. So the potential is endless. Uh, you don't you never have to pull that card out again because uh, you already got the backup, and maybe just take that card and put it away, and that's it. Uh, so has a lot of potential for I think for a lot of different commercial photographers who are their editors it could be in a different part different part of the world uh, if you're doing a low out by spec you know you could be printing them already and what we're going to be doing starting next year in some of the shows we all have the QRC code I take their picture they take their phone the QRC and they all can see the phone they see their images within seconds so if I did an event a couple of shots the I have the QRC phone code maybe because of a sticker and they scan it, and they, as soon as I take the picture, it's already there in their phone. So they have quick access. So people who are doing schools, they can start ordering packages because they, they're excited that moment. If they're in the luau, they're drinking, they're ordering more. That's how I look at it. You know, a lot of my ties. Hopefully in that virgin my ties, but good my ties here. But um, really, it's endless. What you can think of. You know, people are smarter than me, so I'm sure they'll think a lot more things for me. Uh, sensors, uh, again, we we use, uh, okay, three seconds, well, three minutes. Um, X-Trans, with X-Trans does, we can put a lot more colors on one line, red, blue, and green. Bayer, you only can put one red in each line, one red, one blue, uh, so we can do more mixtures of colors, a better pattern. So chrome film was a very random uh, dots of colors all over the place. That's why color or chrome film is, there was no grain because they overlap and you didn't see any grain. So it was great to print for magazine because you saw no grain. It was very, very smooth. Um, very similar to our sensor. That's what we do. And that's why going higher ISO looks very pleasing. For me, it's very pleasing. S10, like I said, the baby of the X-T4, really the baby of the X-T5. Uh, somebody starting out, they want something compact. Give you a quick story. Uh, NEB is a big show in Vegas, broadcast, cine show. I had a gentleman come to me and says, what's your smallest 4K camera? It's like, I showed him, I think, the X-T30 before the X-T32. And he tells me the story because he shoots with a uh, 8K camera. I said, I'm a documentary photographer. I just can't get permits to shoot in Japan or Russia. So I have to come in as a tourist. Um, I thought, well, never thought of that. You know, used to fly into tourism, just do videotapes. Because anytime time you see big equipment, see on a tripod, see lighting, that's it. You get kicked out, you get fined, get arrested some places. Uh, but it allows them to accomplish the quality. And again, you're getting the same quality as cinema in these little cameras. XT5, it just, we added from the XT3 and XT4 is the new sensor, 40 megapixel, IBIS, uh, more challenging, we made it smaller. Uh, the size between XT1 and XT2, and also the same, about the same weight, with a lot more, with the IBIS weight, with the new battery weight, um, I think they did a terrific job. Um, it does 740 shots, one battery charge. Before the XT1, if you had the grip with the additional battery, that was 700 shots, so you actually, we ex exceed it just with that one battery. Uh, comes in silver and black finish. Uh, HS is just black finish. Uh, the rest of the other cameras we do have it in black finish and the silver finish. Uh, so we gave everybody the traditional dials, controls, the rotary, the four-way pad, what everybody really enjoyed, the camera. Uh, pretty much a lot of the features, minus one thing, is the grip, battery grip. But I think during the survey, most people don't use the grip uh, for us to make it smaller, less electronics in the bottom, so there's a little cutoff. But if you need a grip, the H cam uh, H2 camera will provide that for you on both cameras. XT30, the little mighty, could do a lot. I was using the same sensor as the XT3, XT4, S20, just with dials. So 
I mentioned hybrid is a camera that you can customize it for stills and video very quickly. And that's why there's not that many dials, but buttons. These, the X-T5, the X-T30, uh, we consider the tactile, the T tactile. That means the buttons, very tactile without going into the menu. So that's what it kind of really means. Uh, the physical dials that you can go in and see and control uh, without powering up the camera. You can make all your settings on the aperture ring. Uh, most, most, I would say 99% of the lenses. And everything can be controlled, everything physically without powering up the camera. So before you power up, you can double check. Everything looks good. You're ready to go without going into menus. Uh, some of the images uh, from the XT30, I mean, like I said, XT1, a couple of your, you know, generations back, I was printing 40 by 60 big prints. Uh, we just improved each generation, uh, more detail, faster processing, faster of everything. I think the biggest leak that everybody wanted to see was uh, face detection, eye detection, people, subjects and stuff, and they've really done a great job on the ages, the new T5. And for me, for street photography, I think what makes it fun is something light and small. Um, when I went to Europe June and July, uh, it was a trip that was canceled March uh, 2020, like for a lot of folks. Uh, I just took the 100V. I just wanted to enjoy the culture, the foods, and the drinks. And it was a small camera that I had a little peak design bag fit in there, and I did attach the 28 millimeter for Tony, just put the 50 on yours, you'll be happy. And that's a 50 millimeter for portraits. We did that for fo folks who wanted a little bit longer on the 100 SE. Just make it a little bigger, but add a little bit more weight. But we also have it a wider 28, so I wanted more information. I wasn't there to, it's much as in the scenery, but it's the memories of the friends and family we went together with the scene in the background. And my back, my back up was my phone, but I knew it was a great camera. If I dropped it, I know I, by the times I pick it up and work great. I think it's what's well, going to be the phone if it got stolen. That's it. But it was small enough to put it in a little small little bag, get on the train, get on the metro, get on the subway, and you're ready to go. So it's the nice thing about the newer, if the camera's getting newer, you turn it on, it's ready to go. No lag, it's just fast. And XE4, uh, it is one of our smaller cameras. If somehow or some reason you just can't commit with a fixed lens on the 100V, we got the XE4 that is as small, but it's an interchangeable lens. So anybody's like, well, I don't know if I can stick to one lens. The beauty about that is I like shooting, photographing with prime lenses. It kind of pushes you to outside the box because to give you an example, if I'm photographing, traveling, and I got a zoom lens, I'll stand one spot, zoom in, out, zoom out, zoom in, zoom out, without me moving around. The beauty about a fixed lens, you get close to your subject. So there's one place in Paris, a bakery, because I zoomed in, I, I walked in closer, I could smell the smells. Uh, just getting different angles. Of course, it got me to buy some pastries, but uh, that's part of the experience. But moving closer to the subject, the nice thing about having a small camera, if there's a person, they don't feel a uh, sense of threat or anything like that. And I've got people that, they think it was a film camera, so I actually printed some images and I handed it to them and they were just blown away and they never saw that. Again, it comes down to sharing. It's not a one-way street. I like to share my images and they really appreciate that. It might be a dollar, but it gets you a long way. Next time you travel, they will love to get their picture. They'll bring their friends to get their pictures. So it's, it's a lot of fun. A combination but what it does it allows you to to learn and train your eye and that's the best part of it 100V it's a it's a very unique camera it's a leaf shutter the beauty is, is you have four stop neutral density filters sorry Tony where are you Tony that extra filter you can sell but you could if they wanted more but that's built into the camera that can be used for stills and video. And what that does, if there's too much light and you want to shoot wide open, you got to turn on the filter and you can actually reduce that so you get that shutter speed. Or video, that's very important video because you want a certain shutter speed, a uh, certain aperture, certain, certain uh, maybe you want to do frame rate 30 frames per second. It's built in. So 
a very unique camera, very popular camera. We're maybe a few thousand pre-order behind, but uh, don't be disappointed if you really want it. Tony, give him his, your name. He will get them for you. We will get them. Because we kind of stopped uh, producing XT5s, or I'm sorry, XT4s, take that back, XT4s, that production line is now making 100 beats. Each month, each month actually, we're increasing the volume of most cameras. So, so if you're planning to go somewhere and you want that camera, I will start now, and, and he will give you that happy news of that call, say, hey, your camera's in, excited, go in and get it. Um, we are trying to commit to get those cameras in the store. So. It's always been a popular camera. It was our camera that we introduced, our first mirrorless, 11 years ago. And it's just, like I said, it made a lot of photographers a better photographer, but it does have everything programmed. If you want not to think about it, put it on automatic and just point and shoot, and it does a fantastic, fantastic uh, images. A uh, couple of photographers who use this camera, Suzanne Stein. If you've never seen her, there's a documentary video, really good. Uh, but this person poured so much stuff in New York, but she never came out, and she goes in every day and get a talk about it and learn about her life. It's incredible. Uh, I think it went PBS or something like that, yeah, but you can find it on YouTube. It's just incredible story. You know? And that's what uh, Suzette does. Is, is she brings the 100B that they don't feel threatened with this camera, and you'll be surprised how many doors open to you. Um, kind of upon open doors, because I got into Starbucks to take pictures, but uh, it does allow you to get to places that you can't with this LRs or bigger cameras. So. I think uh, everybody should have a regular camera, and they're fun camera, and that's what the 100 is. Uh, sometimes it's the X-Pro3, it's a fun camera, but the 100 I have run to people who have like us and they will rather you do the 100B because they felt threatened that somebody will still like or drop it. And the 100, 100B didn't cost as much and uh, they felt more safe. And, uh, you know, it kind of looks like that, a contacts camera, something like that, but uh, it's a terrific camera. Lenses, we have over 40 some lenses, including some cine lenses for it. Some new lenses that we just introduced so it can handle the 40 megapixel. I mean, all lenses will work, but if you're worried about corner-to-corner -corner sharpness wide open, we did introduce a couple of new uh, 1.4s, plus our new power zoom. This power zoom is a fun lens. It's an F4 throughout, but it's good for cinema and for stills. We just launched our new tripod. I'm going to be using it a lot for my photo walk. It has your, your controls for video and stills. And also your zoom, so I can actually, if I'm on a parade, I can zoom in and out without touching the camera and take the picture. It has the zoom control, so it works some of the XC lenses. Is that, is that it hasn't. Uh, we announced it on the 29th. <laughs> but, but you're being the first ones to show it to you. Yes, so, um, so we did update the firmware update on the cameras on the the first, the 30th, maybe the 30th. So now the firmware, besides XT5 was ready to use this. We added the firmware, so the XT20, XT30, XT3, and XT4. That will talk to it, Bluetooth. I believe it's 199. Um, but it's, I mean, if you want to do low shots, bring the screen, now you can go low without trying to, one hand, you can just hold it down, or if you have, the XT20, or I'm sorry, XT10, you can flip it and then do your self video with the family. Uh, 360, uh, control, I mean, it's a great little unit. Bluetooth, uh, watch battery, but it, I've been running it for over now, for 10 days. We're out of time? Oh, oh, oh okay, I thought that was. Oh, I thought that, that was your watching the. I know we're all out, of, out of time, but uh, I know Diane runs some incredible food. Uh, I could go further, but I will be at the store Sunday. Hours, 10, is it uh, 10 to 2.30? Yes. I have more gear. Uh, I have a lot more gear. Uh, anybody's going to be at the photo walk tomorrow. 
So we have gear for that. Um, we you know, help you with some of the controls, so you have able to work the lens aperture, things like that to make it fun. Um, we'll have myself, Tony, some anybody from the store. There we go. And yeah, there. And so we have a lot of experience uh, Fujifilm um, operators, and so we can make it very fun. We did this three years ago. We had a, a blast. Um, so. Um, any questions? Yes. It's um, $3 every half hour. So street parking in Restaurant Row is $3 per half hour. But there's street parking, there's salt, there should be able to Yeah. I think last time I parked in front of Ruth Chris, I don't know if it's still there. Or but. And if you are coming tomorrow and you're going to be using one of the gears, don't forget your uh, memory card. Bring your SD card. Yeah, bring your SD um, The newer the better, because uh, I kind of give an example. You're using high beam fuel and you put on lead, it's just gonna putt putt. Same thing with cameras. Cameras, you put cards that are five years and older, there's some functions I know it's very slow because of the buffer, and I've seen that. So if you got the newest car, bring that, as new as possible. So we wanna make sure your experience are uh, enjoyable. And if you're not aware of that, bring it and I'll show it to you. But uh, it, I've seen it, um, in an interesting way, we one of my customers who sold one of the cameras, I never knew about it. We were doing an event in Alaska. This gal was having problems with the camera. Says, well, where are the Fuji rep? And it's like, she says, it takes a while to take the picture and then record. And she, she was explaining that her husband bought the camera for her trip to Alaska. And when the, the person buying the counter, not Tony, Tony card, says, would you like to buy a car? He says, oh, we got plenty of cards. Plenty of cards that he had. Car instead of spending the extra maybe twenty 